into the secrets of their power. My name is Robert Pears from Pure Art Ministries. In this episode, we're going to look at the secrets of the power in Smith Wigglesworth's life. When we look at his life and ministry, it's clear that he walked with an incredible anointing of God and saw incredible miracles and demonstrations of power. He would do courageous things that blow our mind. He would get into a healing service, step up and say, who is the sickest? Come forth. And he'd bring them up in front of everybody and he would pray with them recklessly. He would punch, he would hit and do other things. And he astonished people. Uh, I recall the story once where there's this old lady who's dying of cancer and he calls her up and she can't even walk so she's brought up uh, and two people are holding her. And he says, let her go. Let her stand and she falls to the ground. People are horrified. He says, pick her up. And they do. And he says, let her stand. And of course, she falls to the ground again. At this point, he's now lost the crowd. They are screaming at him and thinking how, what a cruel and evil person this man is. And he said, pick her up. And once again, let her go. Well, you can imagine the third time, the outrage of the people, the disgust, this old lady, the pain and everything else that he's inflicted upon her. And he gets madder at them, let her go. Finally, the people holding her do, and she stands. And they look on the ground and they see the cancer lying on the ground. Well, that's Smith Wigglesworth. He would go into funeral homes and grab bodies and throw them against the wall and command them to live. He had no problem offending you. And when he punched people, he said, it's not my fault if you got in the way of the devil. Because what he saw was the enemy. And he had such a love of people and he had an absolute hatred of the enemy. And that really motivated him and disturbed him. It was a great compassion. It may come across in a very gruff and rough way, but he was a man of great compassion. And what he believed was that with faith, there's always an action. Faith demands that you do something. Faith demands that you're fighting the devil, making a stand continuously. Faith was something that was not yesterday. It's now faith that comes out of a now hope and a now love. He didn't care where you were yesterday spiritually. Where are you today? And he walked it and lived it out himself. This was a man that when he got out of bed, he didn't, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Before he got out of bed, he had to have communion with the Lord. He had to have fellowship with the Lord. And then he would jump out of bed and he would dance and sing for 10 to 12 minutes, delighting himself in the Lord and telling himself who he was in the Lord. People would walk up and say to him, how do you feel? And he'd say, I don't ask Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. I tell him how he feels. That's how he was. Many people would have taken it as gruff as I said. You know, I believe it was Lester Summerall turned up at his door one day. It was a man interesting and trying to get to know Smith Wigglesworth, turns up at his little house and um, comes, he's carrying a newspaper and Smith Wigglesworth says, what is that you're carrying? Absolutely, he refuses to let that in the house. He doesn't want lies or deceit in the house. And so Lester Sermon has to leave it outside and come in. And he discovers a man that when he goes in, he's not going to sit down and have a great time of fellowship and teaching, which is what he expected. I want to learn from you. Well, Smith Wigglesworth has them sit down and they get out their Bible and they read. And they read. Then they stop. And then they pray. Then they read. Then they stop. Then they pray. Then they read. Then they go to lunch. They pray. Eat lunch. Then they get back to reading and stuff like that. Lester Summerall left disappointed. You know, I wanted a time of just being poured into. But the next day, all of a sudden, he realized he got something. 
and he was hungry for more of what he got. Because Smith Wigglesworth had a relationship through prayer and the word with the presence of God, and he discovered that he had fixed his mind, cleansed his mind, because he believed that the critical ingredient to seeing the baptism of the Holy Spirit with power was not the tearing and waiting. He said, you've received the Holy Spirit. If you just receive Him, you get Him. But the power component comes when we cleanse ourselves, when we bring every thought captive, when we walk a sanctified life by the mind, soul, and body being in agreement with the Word. And that's why what he did, he did. Why he said what he said? Because he disciplined himself daily through spending time in the Word and prayer, that his spirit man was alive. There was a fire. There was an excitement about him. There was an anointing. Many ministers live in the anointing of the ministry. When they get up on stage and they preach or do something, God turns up an anointing because of the people. And it's wonderful. It's like being plugged into a wall, the electricity. It's exciting. And then they go and they leave. And so many of them have moral failures and other issues. Why? Because they have not built up their spiritual man to walk in that anointing in daily life. See, we're not meant to just minister in the Spirit. We're meant to walk and live in and by the Holy Spirit. That means continuously staying in that environment where the Holy Spirit is Lord. Where He's Lord, He's going to be continually reminding of the Word. He must have full control over your mind, your thought, your will, and your emotions. If that thought doesn't line up with the Word, it must go. And you must make the decision to deal with it. Paul wrote that we were to lay aside, cast off the old man. A decision you must make. See, we want the Holy Spirit to come in and just change us and transform us with no involvement of ourselves. Smith Wigglesworth believed what he saw in the Word, that you must make a decision. You must make a choice and you must cast off and you must discipline yourself through daily praying the Word, continuously praying the Word. It takes a time to build that up. And he explained that great faith is built through great fights. You're not going to get there overnight. It's developed and built over time. You have to go through some things and you have to trust in the Word. You have to see breakthrough through the Word. It's not always easy. You have to come to a place where it's not what you think and you get your thoughts off of you. What you hold into your hands prevents you receiving what God wants to pour in your hands. When I'm fixed on me and on my concerns, guess what? They are Lord. And we're not able to receive how God thinks about us, what God wants for us. And that's what Smith Wigglesworth was getting at. And Smith Wigglesworth said that he learned everything he knew from his wife, Polly Wigglesworth. She taught him to read. But I want you also to understand, he, of course, stepped into the healing ministry that I believe was a Dowie church in Leeds that he then would share the healing ministry with Polly and she got actively involved. Now, she had been, of course, in the Salvation Army. She had got great ranks and was going up the ladder and was becoming well accepted and had a great career in the Salvation Army. She had learned a lot from the Salvation Army, which she shared. Of course, uh, Smith was also in the Salvation Army and they learned how to pray. You know, something powerful about the Salvation Army was the fact that they prayed at that time. They would come together with an agreement that they're believing God for 50 new people to come to the Lord. And they prayed and they fasted and they were desperate before God. There was a fervency. There was a light to their prayer. There was something about their prayer that Smith saw and it changed him and he liked. And him and Polly prayed like that. Smith Wigglesworth often said, you need to storm heaven. Before he would go in and pray over people, he stormed heaven. 
So often he would face some incredible challenges, some of the greatest sicknesses. But he said he had stormed heaven before he got in there so that he, see, so we are reactive. He proactively prayed so that when he went in, he had already won the victory and had the resources and the provisions of heaven for the need. He learned so much from Polly Wigglesworth. She started to receive the leaves of healing. Dowie was a man that learned a lot because of his, the church that he'd been a part of, that he got saved, came from the Edward Irvinites. And Edward Irving taught strongly, line upon line, precept upon precept. And we see that in Dowie. So that when you are building something scripturally, like the healing message, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. It's not just taking a verse here, but building it from the Word. It has to be consistent in the Word. And so Paul Wigglesworth taught him from the leaves of healing the um, doctrine, the depth of the doctrine of healing. They share the same mindset as Dowie, that they reject all kinds of medicine, and they go after it with the same intensity as Dowie. Now, of course, Polly Wigglesworth would be baptized by Dowie, uh, I believe it was 1901, uh, but Smith Wigglesworth was not. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth is perhaps mentioned, his street, of course, his wife is mentioned in the Leaves of Healing. But he learned a lot. When she died, it became one of the greatest challenges. And when people ask him, what's the secret of your power? He would point to that event. Because he lay on her grave, recognizing, here's the lady that's meant most to me, not just in the natural, but spiritually. I am where I am today because of her. He had backslidden. He'd gone through a period of time where he was a man of great anger. He would get just enraged with anger. And Polly Wigglesworth was a woman of great love. And of course, there was the infinite incident where he locks her out. He learns from him. And of course, he locked himself away for 10 days. And he sought the Lord. And it really brought forth the real change that Smith Wigglesworth was never the same after that. He never got angry after that. But it was Polly Wigglesworth. She provoked him. She challenged him to go higher. You know, I believe that's an awesome trait in people. It's not just to encourage you, but to challenge you to go further, to challenge you to go deeper. What a wonderful thing when we meet people in ministries that provoke us, stir us, and there's something deeper, there's something more out there. And they provoke us to go further with that. And, of course, Polly did. So he lays on her grave and he's broken and he's in tears. And God says, get up and go. I can't get up and go. And he said, if you give me her anointing and mine. And he got up and he really began in that second stage um, after 1912. You see that he would come to America and the, the Wigglesworth that we know really came after that time period. There's a boldness to him. There is a, an incredible anointing. He goes after things with great ferocity. And I believe it was out of that event because at that point he died. It was him and the Lord. He experienced several things. He experienced, of course, we know the hemorrhoids from earlier in his life, but he also experienced where he um, herniated his back and he was in severe pain, unable to walk in his later age. And he would not back down or quit or give it. He was a man that lived it out. And he saw victory over heal of sickness in his own life by fighting it with the Word. He fought daily through faith attacking it, speaking over it, coming against it. And it came out, I believe, this event where he died and he was completely sold out. There's something powerful when you come to a place and you consecrate yourself to the Lord. You give yourself an absolute commitment. Any of the great heroes of faith that stepped into a high call, 
that was a critical ingredient. They consecrated themselves. And I believe there and then he did. When he got up, the old man was gone. He went on. He had nothing left to live for. He was pressing forward towards heaven. But every day on the earth, and he lived to be an old age, he would do as much damage and win as many souls for Jesus. His faith had an action, and he was third people, are you ready? Ready for what? For more. He wanted you to walk in victory with a laugh on your face. That you should be having fun and enjoying the Holy Ghost. Life should be exciting. Life should be filled with the joy of the Lord. He would challenge churches. He would bring them in and he would get up and say, Did you come into this place with thanksgiving and shouting and praising? Well, you know what? Go back out and come back in doing it. Because he took the word literally and he lived it out. I think many of us love Smith Wigglesworth. I'm not sure how many of us would like to have an afternoon or a day with him. He probably would challenge you. He'd probably stretch you. He would probably offend you. But maybe we need that. If we are going to go deeper and further, we've got to get a greater hunger and commitment and a consecration of our lives. We've got to sell out. We've got to be prepared and ready. Ready for what? For more. That God, the Lord God, the limitless God, wants to give us so much more than we're able to receive if we would just step forward in faith and obedience and that in the difficult and dark times, just hold on, keep fighting by faith because there was always a fresh hope in Smith Wigglesworth. And we've got to have a now hope, a now faith, and a now love. Well, I pray that you're encouraged and provoked and that you would just be as I said, come to this place of absolute commitment and get in you that ready spirit and live boldly for Jesus. Thank you.